All right. I know that in the last couple of weeks, in our last week, in fact, I kind of took you a basic introduction to transistors. Um, I gave the general class, I showed them a movie yesterday, which really was pretty good for a little more in-depth understanding. But you won't really need that, and I won't don't want to confuse you guys too far. So we'll go through that when you take the general class. I happen to find one that's very good. I might change my mind throughout this class. So sometime I, if we have the time, I might show you that one. Um, I do want to bring up something that I got reminded of today, and I always try to include in every class. We will get to a chapter that covers this late in the book, but I want to go through something very important. Uh, in your book, in figure 3.15, uh, there's a discussion about ground. It says the sim different symbols for grounds can be confusing. And it goes and explains the different symbols for grounds. Um, they're actually somewhat interchangeably used by a lot of people. I wouldn't get too wrapped in, up in it, but I do want to tell you something about grounds. Grounds are important for two reasons. One, physically grounding a station to the earth is a safety feature. It is also necessary for efficient transmission and reception. A misconception a lot of hams have is that you need a, or have a separate physical ground for, for a radio ground and a separate electrical ground. In fact, they should be both the same physical ground. But there is a difference between what is an RF ground and an electrical ground, it has to do with the characteristics of how the electromagnetic field is traveling. It is not the physical ground itself. And because hams are so confused about it and use, and that we've kind of gotten like uh, a bit of a folklore about grounding. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, the National Electric Code actually put a chapter in or a section in, Article uh, 810, to cover radio, electronic equipment, things like uh, um, uh, cable television installs, um, and it includes specifically ham radio and even CB stations. And fundamental, I think in 810.30 or 350, is a reference that you've got to adhere to uh, the NEC article 250 on grounding and bonding. To shortcut all this, in article 250, of the National Electric Code, it says that all earth grounds, all grounds, and all ground connections must tie together in common. Every ground must be tied together. And the reason for this is both safety, both to protect you from uh, things like lightning and electrical shock, and to prevent fires. And the reason this is so important and so many hams miss it, and it came up in a discussion on Facebook today, and I answered it for somebody, I seldom answer this online because uh, I have some concerns about if anybody screws up and they misinterpret my advice as a licensed electrician and an engineer, I can be hauled in the court and sued for giving bad advice. So I try not to in this case. But the code calls for a common grounding for a reason. And that's that if you walked outside and you drove a ground rod into the ground, 
and you walked maybe five or 10 feet away and you drove another one down. You kept driving around. Once you got them all driven to the ground, if you took a voltmeter and you put the voltmeter and, and just measured just between all each ground rod you put in the ground, if you put down 20 ground rods, you might get 20 different voltages because no particular spot on the earth is necessarily at the same ground potential as the next spot over. There can be reasons for more electrons being available in one spot and less in another. It has to do with the materials in the earth. It has to do with so many factors. We can't control it. So the best thing we can do is by tying them together, we make sure there's no differences between. What happens if you have differences? Like if you ground your antenna at the tower with a ground rod 100 feet from the house, and the electrical system is, of course, grounded at the entrance to your house, there could be many, many volts difference between those two spots. An amazing amount of voltage difference. And so you, you create something that we call ground loops. A lot of hams misunderstand ground loops. They think it happens because maybe you set up, a, you ground your uh, equipment around in a circle and that makes a loop. No, if you ground one thing to another, to another, to another, and it ends up like a circular ring connect of connections, that's not the cause of ground loops. The cause of ground loops is because you've got different currents flowing around different paths, making different loops, their own circuits, because one ground is at one voltage and another ground is at another. So when we get to that section, I want you all to keep this in mind. Always keep in mind that grounds need to be tied together. Now for a little on the air tip. If you ever hook up a ground to your radio and you know it's tied back to the common ground and you hook up your radio and you get more noise, you've got a ground loop out there, but it's not because you hooked up your radio. Some other device in the electrical system of your home or nearby has a ground loop and it's not grounded properly or one of your neighbors was kind enough to go whack in a bunch of ground rods that aren't tied together. And half of his house has one potential difference to ground and the other half has another half. And one day he might be able to be lucky enough to grab two of the wrong ground wires and say his last uh, 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 statements in this world. And yes, a ground potential difference can be that great. Another thing I want to tell you, this is another misconception. A lot of people think high voltage can kill you. You can get hit with a million volts and survive. You can get hit with just 50 volts and die. It's because the human body has a certain resistance. To stop your heart, take something like 100 milli, actually 50 milliamps. It's not very much current. It's less light, less energy than a flashlight. The thing that causes us to think that voltage does it is because the body has a resistance of its own, it usually takes around 50 volts in order for a current of 50 milliamps to flow through your body. And it's why we think it's caused by voltage. Now, the higher the voltage, the greater the current that can flow through your body, you're going to be past that 50 milliamps in a heartbeat if you're hooked to 13,800 uh, volts at the transformer out at the, out, out where the pole is in the backyard. And if you even stand too close, to a half a million uh, volt or even a quarter of a million volt overhead transmission line. That's why they put them way up in the air. It will zap you from, I don't know, uh, I think uh, the 
208,000 lines of Zapia around 20 feet away. That's why they're up on 50 foot towers. And the uh, they're usually 75, 100 foot up to the half a million volt uh, lines. That's why they're up that high. So all that's just side note to get, get everything going and then we're gonna start the class. Okay. All right, I wanna come forward with you a little bit. Uh, chapter two, um, we're gonna start, by the way, we're gonna start on radio circuits. Chapter two, uh, just we, we, I introduced you and so does the book, just certain terminology. And uh, one of them is frequency. And I told you that frequency, which by the way, I didn't tell you by formula, frequency is related to time. And the way it's related to time is frequency is basically one over the time of a wave. Now the time of a wave, how long it takes a wave to make one wavelength is fixed. Um, by the frequency and the, and so one over that time is the frequency so what it means to say is when we're looking at a wave i think i described to you that a wave starts at zero goes to a maximum peak curves up curves down goes to zero goes through zero goes to a negative peak starts curving back up comes back to zero when it gets back to zero for the starting at zero, passing through zero, and the third time it's at zero, that's one complete wave. Now, if we've created a wave in a high frequency, there's going to be many, many of those waves within a second. At a very low frequency, there's only going to be one. So if you have one wave per second, really slow, much slower than we can talk or think. If you have one wave per second, the wavelength is going to be one times the speed of light. The speed of light is... 300,000 meters per second. If you, uh, if, and we use that for wavelengths. So that would be the wavelength of one wave per second, 300,000 meters. Take a long piece of wire to make that antenna. On the other hand, I think you have to wrap that one around the earth. I'm not sure. I, I don't know how many meters around the earth. Anyway, when we talk about radio waves, we're talking usually in thousands, thousands or millions of waves per second. So that's, as we talk about frequency, that's frequency. So when we're operating at, say, 144 megahertz or 144 million cycles a second. We divide 300, uh, or yeah, we divide it by 300. I'm sorry, we divide 300,000 uh, 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 meters by the frequency, we get a number that doesn't quite work out, but it comes close to two. Uh, two times 150 megahertz works out perfectly to two meters. And we use rough numbers to define the, the bands by their names, two meters, 20 meters, whatever. If we looked at the um, 10 meter band, for example, 10 meter band is close to 30 megahertz. And you divide that um, with, uh, uh, you divide that into 300 and you get roughly 10. And you can, by the way, use the whole numbers. 
I mean, you don't have to use all the decimal or all the all the zeros. It works out in megahertz to work out perfect. So if you take um, uh, 30 um, megahertz, which is roughly just at the end of the 10 meter band, and you divide that into 300, you get the wave. You get the wavelength. If you take the wavelength, which is a 10 meter band, and you multi multiply, uh, I'm sorry, and you divide the uh, 300 by 10, which is the speed of light, divided by 10, that will give you the frequency of exactly 10 meters. So our 10 meter band tops off at 10. Our two meter band is really just a little bit under two meters and so on. But they are conventions we use. So now the way we produce radio waves is by, by oscillation. We create a transistor circuit or a tube circuit, which will oscillate up and down, up and down. Uh, if somebody wants to shake their head, no, please do. But I think I told you guys how capacitors and inductors inhibit the flow of voltage and inhibit the flow of current. A capacitor delays the flow of current. I mean, delays the flow of voltage or the, the pat movement of voltages. It holds back voltage while it charges up and it delays voltages. And it, it delays the electromagnetic force of a wave. A, an inductor or a coil, same thing, impedes the current flow, the flow of electrons, because it builds almost instantly a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is spinning in one direction. And in an AC circuit, both of these, we're talking about AC circuits because all radio waves are AC circuits. It impedes the flow of current by having a magnetic field that maybe is going right hand, spinning to the right as it's positive, and then all of a sudden gets hit with a, a negative charge half of the wave. Now that magnetic field's going the wrong way. It's got to take time to neutralize that wave, that electro, I'm sorry, that magnetic field. It's got to neutralize that field and build the field up in the opposite direction. In a capacitor, you build a charge in a forward direction. When the wave goes negative, now you got the wrong charge facing it. It's got to discharge and recharge the opposite charge. They both do these things. And by doing this, they cause delays. And if we introduce that delay into a trans transistor circuit, we can cause the transistor to oscillate. Not going to go into great detail because the book doesn't require this for you and neither do the questions. But essentially the, the transistor first outputs forward, then outputs back and forward and back and forth, essentially. So once we have an oscillated signal, that becomes a general wave. That wave we try to make on a frequency we're going to transmit. In an AM signal, we call this the carrier wave. And it is a unique property of the AM signal, and that's that that's fixed. That wave is always whatever frequency we're operating on. So when we create such a wave, instead of an AM signal, Early off, the way they communicated and the way that people who use CW communicate and why, and now to explain why we call it continuous wave, all there is is that pure wave. You just generate that wave and turn it on and off for Morse code. When you key the mic, I'm sorry, key the key, the Morse code key, it either transmits when it's on or it doesn't transmit when you're not 
clicked on. And the short and long pulses are what we transmit. But in the case of uh, uh, phone, what we have to do is we have to carry the information, phone meaning voice. For phone communications, we have to carry the information of the speech itself. We do that by capturing the audio frequency of the sound, like through a microphone. And then we take that sound and we, in a sense, mix it to ride along with our fundamental frequency for transmission the frequency we want to operate on. In an AM signal, we do it with amplitude. Listen to this carefully, because the pictures and things drawn for you are to help you visualize, but here's what's really going on. In an AM signal and even a sideband signal, what happens is we're oscillating at a given frequency. Now, what the mixing circuit permits is that based upon the audio frequency we convert that frequency to level control that controls how strong the am signal is or even sideband so when you talk at a low frequency it's relatively low when you talk at a higher frequency, it's relatively high. And by doing that, AM reproduces uh, or represents or imprints the sound on the, on the wave as louder or softer signal strength. So now when you do this, with a pure AM signal, you with an AM transmitter, you're transmitting pretty constant amount of power out. You're fluctuating um, what we call sidebands, regions right beside the fundamental wave. You're making them louder and softer. So an AM signal is usually about five kilohertz wide. Right down the center of it is the carrier wave. And in fact, if you tune it with a Morse code receiver, you can hear a tone right on that frequency. If you tune right on it, exactly. But the two portions of bandwidth, just a little bit above and below the fundamental frequency, are fluctuating higher and lower in value, or power, I mean, uh, and that produces the information that gets transmitted. At the other end, the receiver takes in this wave, tunes, tuned down the center frequency, and what it does is right off the bat, it strips out the radio wave when it first comes in, takes that and grounds it out with something called a filtering circuit. And the thing that permits that are capacitors and inductors. They delay and we can use them. We can, we can make them so that they delay and uh, enough together to only pull out one frequency or all above or all below a frequency. And we get rid of everything but the audio. So everything up in the radio spectrum, we dump as soon as it gets in the radio, the receiver. And then we amplify the very small signal that we received. And once we amplify that strong enough to drive a speaker, it reproduces back as a, uh, as a audio sound reproduce just like what we sent. 
Now, there's a little bit more, and we're going to cover it as we go through questions, and, and we'll get into it in depth. So we begin first with a circuit called a modulator, and a modulator combines the speech with the RF frequency. Now, FM is a little different. By the way, sideband is the same as AM, except we strip out one of the one of the sides of the two sides of the fundamental frequency, depending whether we use upper or lower sideband. And then we also filter out the uh, the carrier wave itself in single sideband. We only use the sideband. So we're only sending like a fluctuating signal. Now, FM works a little different. In FM, we do not modulate with ampli the ampli uh, amplitude of the wave. We don't make it um, more or less powerful. We change the frequency of the wave. So when we're talking at a low frequency, we're shifting the whole wave down a little, a, a little lower. Uh, and we're usually about six is a, is narrow FM. We hams use wide FM, which is usually about 15 kilo, kilohertz. So when we're talking on a frequency, an FM, like on a repeater, that signal is transmitting uh, based upon our audio on a frequency that moves higher and lower as a frequency. An FM circuit called an FM detector picks that up. Once again, we strip out the RF frequency and we're left with just the audio frequency. And the same sort of thing is done. If you should come close to understanding now why it's easy to make radios that are AM and FM. Because once you get past the first stages, they're pretty much the same thing after that. So in either case, depending on whether we use amplitude modulation, which is AM, it's the amplitude of the signal that from that conveys the voice information, or FM, which is frequency modulation, we still have to modulate the, the wave that we began with. For the, and so the first stage is always a modulator, either an AM or FM modulator. And I decided to pull up a movie for you anyway. That same one I gave the general class because I'm not here to make this more confusing, but to try to make it less confusing. One of the reasons I like some of these videos is because uh, they can do animations I can't do for you. And the animations often make it simpler to understand what's going on. In this video, I, I use a, a similar one. It might be the same one years ago. And it does kind of give a really good overview of how radio works. The first thing I want you to understand, and I'm not trying to be mean, and we're back in the class now. Most hams have no idea in the world how radio works, including me. It's magic. It's a box. <clears throat> the radio is stuffed inside, and it's being held in by magic smoke. If you let the magic smoke out, the radio won't work anymore. Don't let that magic smoke out. Now, let's see what this uh, put together by a professional uh, uh, Oh, uh, let me see if I can even find it. Hmm, doesn't want to show it to me there. It's got to be here somewhere. Here it is. Let's see what this professional PhD who put this together says uh, radio is. And I'm going to go full screen with this, I hope. Yeah, well. In the modern era, radio 
control everything. I like it to go full screen. Are you seeing it full screen? There we go. Okay. The tunes in your car driving down the road to the police radio in the car that's pulling you over for not signaling your turn. These waves are undetectable and invisible to human senses, but they make up the foundation of modern connected technology. While the roots of modern connected technologies may be radio waves, the underlying tech that makes radio waves possible is a rather simple concept to understand. Any person can make a simple radio in their home for a few bucks, which is part of the reason this foundational communication tech dates back to 1895. As a demonstrable introduction to understanding what radio is, we'll engage in a simple explanation of how you might make one. All you need is a battery, a coin, and an AM radio. Tune the radio to a static channel and start tapping that coin on the two terminals of the battery. You'll start hearing that tapping through the AM radio. By doing this, you'll have made a crude radio transmitter capable of communicating in Morse code or random taps over just a few inches, though. What you're doing in this process is exciting electrons on the transmitter side, the battery and the coin, which then is received as a signal on the receiving side, the AM radio, and turned back into an audio output. What you're doing is completing a circuit between the battery terminals, which creates an electromagnetic force, which can be detected by the receiver in the AM radio. In order to under... Let me stop this for a minute. Don't actually do this. You will burn your fingers. So uh, seriously, uh, somebody once tried this when I get, showed this video. I forgot about this part. And you will seriously burn your fingers. If you do this with a lithium battery, you might burn your house down. So don't actually do this, okay? All right. And radios in more detail than what we've just discussed, we need to take a little trip through history. Back in the early days of radio technology, in the whereabouts of the early 1900s, radio transmitters were referred to as spark coils. This was due to the fact that they create large high voltage sparks, upwards of 20 kilovolts to send out a signal. The issue was the message was sent out on all frequencies in the radio spectrum. I'm gonna go back to that because it's an important part of radio history. Spark gap is where we began. And I wanna find that picture, there it is. Go back just a little bit more. Too far. Here we go. This is actually a good representation of spark gap um, system. The one and only exception that I will tell you is that they refine this quite a bit. This is one of the earliest spark cap designs. And I'm going to explain it all to you before we go on. Because this is a basic radio. What we have here is a power source. Eventually, they went to uh, a generator motor combination type thing or even an engine uh, to replace having to use batteries. But nevertheless, you need a, a voltage source. And they had a coil, much like the coil in early uh, automobile coils, to uh, boost up the voltage. And they had a couple of uh, pins that could be screwed in and out to form a gap, an area for the voltage to travel arc across. You can calculate what that arc has to be based on how many volts you can supply out of the coil. Now, when you create an arc gap like that, there's an oscillation to it. An arc or lightning, like for example, an arc is like lightning out of the sky. When you drive along in your car during a thunderstorm, you can hear static crashes. You can actually hear them across the entire radio spectrum in any frequency. And the reason for that is that is exactly how this system worked. When you have that lightning flash in the sky and you see a strike coming down from the sky, you're only seeing a billionth of it because you can't see it fast enough. 
It's going up and down, back and forth for a short period of time until all the electrons discharge. What happens is there's a buildup somewhere in the sky or on the ground, one or the other of either electrons or lack of electrons. And suddenly they fly up from the ground of, to where there's a lack of electrons or they sail down to the ground where there's a lack, where whichever starts it, doesn't matter. Because when they all get there, they drag a bunch of too many with them. So they all go flying back. And as you all know, for every action, you probably got taught this in science class, for every action there's an equal but opposite reaction. So as the electrons fly down, they draw too many of their cousins with them. So they get to the ground and now it's charged the opposite way. It sends electrons flying back up into the sky and it gets too many up there until they go back and forth, back and forth, settle out. In the meantime, they are making just about, they're making way a, a, a wave that's basically on every part of the radio spectrum. And in the early days of radio, they have one channel. Now, you notice they have here something they call Leyden jars. Leyden jars were early capacitors. And they had a tuning coil. They have these. These are there in order to retard the voltage and retard the current. And... and Essentially, that permits some minor tuning of the frequencies. Now, they still use just about all the spectrum, but they didn't use, they could basically make it more intense in one area or another. So it could correlate with the antenna design. So this was basically a matching circuit. Today, we know this circuit as a tuner. And antenna tuners are still in use today. This is basically the oscillator. And of course, this is the key, keying it. There is no modulator at this point. Okay? Now, in the early days of radio, when it first were uh, spark gap hams and others, everybody operated on the same frequency, basically, because it was all one thing. Because no matter where you had a receiver tuned, it was going to hear everything, no matter, it was all the same no matter where. Imagine everything's all together on all the frequencies. And uh, one of the big hardships was converting to tuned individual frequency circuits with then electronic valve controlled oscillators vacuum tubes and a lot of the guys the early hams got really upset like what do you mean i'm only going to be able to hear them on one frequency how will i hear everybody else well there weren't that many in the early days but as it got more crowded in the early in the late uh, 1900s early 1800s schools of radio electronics were sprouting all over the world Paris, France alone had 800 schools for training people in the art of radio. And it was getting to be a little too crowded for this game. So watch the rest of this movie. It'll catch up. And you'll, uh, I don't think I'll interrupt too much more. This was due to the fact that they create large high voltage sparks upwards of 20 kilovolts to send out a signal. The issue was the message was sent. Is it possible to turn the video volume up? Let me try. Meaning that there was. I think I got to go here. Let's see if we can get this volume up. Let's try this. It's essentially only one localized channel. This was fine and dandy back in the days where no one was really using Is that radio, better? But nowadays, do something like this and you'll get fined or... Much better. Okay. Oh, here it is. Okay. 
the prism. These early spark coils were essentially doing the same thing as the coin and battery experiment, except at a much larger scale, meaning that they had a lot higher range. Riding the magic school bus back to the modern era, and today's radios use sine waves to transmit all sorts of information, from audio to video to raw data. By utilizing sine waves for transmission, radios and devices can distinguish different channels based on frequency, or the number of cycles in the sine wave per second. This allows tens to hundreds to thousands of channels on modern radios all in the same space without too much interference. Every single radio has two parts, a transmitter and a receiver. The transmitter is responsible for taking a string of data and encoding it to a sine wave. After that encoding happens, it can also be amplified and sent out across the air. The receiver, rather expectedly, receives the radio waves and decodes the message encoded into the sine wave. Each side of the system uses antennas to radiate and or receive the signal. Relating radios back to your life a little bit, chances are you're watching this video as a result of a transmission of radio waves. Cell phones use radios in their most basic form. They contain both transmitters and receivers and can run both at the same time. In general, phones use frequency modulation, or FM, in a frequency range of 800 megahertz in any one of 1,600 individual frequencies. All of those That's no longer true. It's much higher now. Right now, but hang on as we dive deeper. Back to our simple battery demonstration. We can recall that an electromagnetic force was created when the battery circuit was completed. Modern radios build off of this idea by creating rapidly changing electric currents on the transmitter side. One of the best way of doing this is by utilizing sine waves, as we discussed. To create a sine wave, radios use capacitors and inductors to vary the current and voltage in a controlled means. Transistors are used to amplify the signal so that it has a further range. The problem, though, as you might have picked up, is that sine waves don't natively carry any information. They provide a foundation for transmitting information, like the Oreo cookie is the transmitter for that delicious filling, or like crackers are the foundations to that dry-aged Gouda. You get the point. In order to get sine waves to actually carry information, you need to modulate it. You can do this in three ways. Pulse modulation, amplitude modulation, and frequency modulation. Pulse modulation means that you turn the sine wave on and off, just like the IT guy suggested. Doing this allows you to easily send Morse code, but that's just about it. Pulse modulation is rarely used except to control blocks across the US. The simplicity of pulse modulation also allows one pulse modulator to cover massive areas like the entire US. Yep. Well, one thing I want to correct him on is really kind of wrong. We, of course, use um, CW, which is a form of pulse modulation, but modern digital communications are also pulse modulated. This um, uh, video was produced when cell phones were still analog and um, they hadn't yet reached that stage. So the person who put this together didn't consider all this. We hams were of course already using digital techniques. And when you send uh, like, text like ASCII text uh, over the air, which is teletype, or when we send uh, packet radio, which is pretty much what um, texting over the phone is, it's digitized and we're actually sending, in some cases, but not all, pure um, pulsed sine waves turned on and off and the intervals between the on and the off periods uh, determine what character is being sent. And there are a number of schemes for doing that. I won't cover it here, but, I, I, but it'll help you in the future. I don't want to make that uh, statement of his mislead you. Modulation, on the other hand, is what is utilized by AM radio stations and TV signals to encode data. This is this amplitude format, modulation. The amplitude or peak-to-peak -peak voltage of the wave is changed. 
you can imagine this as the wave from a person's voice being combined with a sine wave to create a new, rather complex sine wave with the same frequency, but with a lot more data inside. Finally, frequency modulation, otherwise known as FM, is used for FM radio and tons of other wireless tech. In this encoding technique, the sine wave frequency changes slightly based on the signal. This means that the distance between the peaks of the waves is varied based on the data that's trying to be transmitted. Bringing all of these different techniques back into the real world, we can begin to understand them a little further. If you sit in your car and tune your radio to AM680, that means that the transmitting station was operating at 680,000 hertz, meaning that the sine wave repeats 680,000 times per second. The voice of the speaker or the music on the transmitting side is modulated onto that wave through amplitude modulation. Then, the signal is amplified up to 50,000 watts for larger AM radio stations and then sent into space utilizing the antenna. Your car's radio picks up that signal, utilizing its own antenna. This can be as simple as a wire or a metal stick. In conjunction with the tuner on your radio tuning to the specific frequency, the tuner starts resonating at 680 kilohertz. Called resonance, this principle allows the radio to essentially ignore any other signals in the air. The signal then passes to the detector, or demodulator, that takes the voice or music from the wave, utilizing a device called a diode, and translates it back into audio. The final step in the process is for the radio to amplify the signal so you can hear it and change the volume as needed. FM radios have different detector setups and translate frequency into sound rather than amplitude, but otherwise they operate in the same way. Data can be encoded onto a constantly changing signal utilizing different modulation techniques that have advantages and disadvantages to each method. Nearly everything that communicates wirelessly around us uses radio waves to do so, and creating your own simple radio is actually a very manageable task. Over the last century, radio has radically changed the course of humanity and rapidly accelerated the growth of the information age. Hope you all got that. Okay. Let me uh, stop the share. And obviously, the uh, the prof who uh, put that together happens to be a ham radio operator. Let's see if I can turn this thing off. There we go. Ah, there. Anyway. The fundamentals there are pretty self-explanatory, and it sums up what this chapter uh, sums up for you. Later in the book, around chapter five, we're going to go into some details. But that is the real magic smoke. We Radios are really relatively simple. The complexity comes in that we have to deal with with cleaning up stuff and perfecting the audio and, and getting rid of the unwanted components when we don't need them. But basically, it's kind of a chess game of, okay, I've got this radio wave, and it's got information, and what can I do with it? I'm going to open up and share with you a screen. It's fancy-dancy drawing. 
Uh, you may have seen uh, probably drew one similar to it for you. I'm pretty sure this one was drawn for the general class. But it's where I'm going to explain some things. And if you take a capacitor and you introduce a wave to it, it is going to oppose that wave, at least the voltage of that wave, because as one side charges up, say this side gets positive, this side becomes negative because the wave is going positive. So the side is going positive. The other side is going to get negative, right? Well, when the wave reaches this point where it's switching around, now this side is positive, this side is negative, but the capacitor is still charged the opposite way. So it wants to delay the voltage. Now the current keeps flowing right through, but it gets delayed. The voltage, I mean, gets delayed. So we say that the voltage lags behind the current. Now, in an inductor, when an inductor it's when a current goes through an inductor in one direction, it makes a magnetic field around the inductor. But when that wave starts the other wave, the other other way, well, that magnetic field is rotating around it the wrong way. It's opposing the flow of electrons. So it opposes the current. A capacitor or an inductor can put the current or the voltage ahead or behind each other by just short of 90 degrees. So if we have a capacitor and this is a voltage, okay, well, the voltage will, uh, the red line is the voltage. The capacitor's hooked to a, a wave. Well, as the Capacitor charges up, the current's flowing right away. But until and only until the capacitor charges completely, the voltage waits and it doesn't, it nothing, no voltage is across the two plates yet. It gets there. And then when it hits this reverse the wave going the other way, the reverse back and forth flow of electrons basically makes the voltage stay delayed. Now, when that happens, every, every capacitor has a unit of measure for how much charge it can hold. And that unit of measure is Henry's. So a capacitor is one Henry is, is about the size of uh, two garbage cans. They're huge. Capacitors we use in radio circuits are very tiny. They'll be a micro Henry's, which are the thousands of Henry, uh, milli Henry's, or even pico Henry's, uh, millions and billions of a Henry. But the time it will take to charge is dependent on two things. The resistance of this current, because that slows the charge, and how much plate area there is to before it gets fully charged. That's the Henry's. Okay? Now, when, uh, pay no attention to these ohms here right now. I'll get to that in a second. When a coil is first energized, it's really like a dead short, short circuit, but a magnetic field builds around it instantly. That opposes the current. So the current gets delayed. Now this is flipped. The red is now the current. But the voltage is instantly across it because it's like a dead short. So right away, the voltage just moves on its way, just happy as can be. But the current is opposed by the, elect by the magnetic field. And when it finally is able to overcome that, it, because the field is fully established for it to be able to travel, why well, then the wave begins. 
up to nine, just short of 90 degrees out of phase or sync with the voltage. We call this apparent, well, let me explain a little better before I tell you what we call it. When we have this happen, you notice that when, in this example, when the voltage is at a peak, the current is zero. And when the current's at a peak, the voltage is zero. This, this is 90 degrees out of phase, by the way, close to it. Well, because of that, the apparent power going out has been reduced because the current and the voltage are out of phase. The condition that does this essentially looks like a resistor might. You know, a resistor has a given value. And whatever a resistor's value is, that's how much energy it basically throws away as heat. Well, in an inductor or a capacitor on an AC circuit, we throw away energy, but it's not thrown away. We lock it up out of phase, just as a resistor might. When we do that, we call that reactance. And reactance is labeled with a letter L. And there can either be an inductive reactance, X sub L, which is here, or a capacitive reactance. And the unit of measures for, for measurement for reactance is in ohms, okay? So the next thing is there's a formula for calculating out because it turns out, and then by the way, this only applies to sine waves. Ra fortunately, radio waves are sine waves. This formula only applies to sine waves. X sub L or the uh, reactance of an inductor is going to be two times the uh, value of pi, which is 3.14, and you can look up the rest of the digits, times the frequency. Because the frequency changes this equation. And then times the inductance of the coil measured in Henry's. I think I said capacitors are Henry's. I meant inductors are in Henry's. Capacitors are measures in farads. Farads. A full farad capacitor is huge, like I said. So the formula for capacitive reactance is pretty much the inverse of that. Because one is the current uh, lagging, the other is the voltage lagging. They're opposites of each other. So at a given frequency, there's a value of a capacitor and, a re and an inductor. Not in this example. But there's some value where they both would be the same. When that occurs, as if we find the value uh, so that the reactive capa uh, re react uh, capacitive reactants and the inductive reactants for that frequency are the same. The way you do that basically is start with a coil and calculate out what its reactance is and then what you need for a induct uh, for a capacitor that would also be at that frequency the same. Of course, if we use a variable capacitor or a variable inductor, we can tweak them. But when they're the same, that becomes so, uh, we have a term for that. That term is the word resonance. And at resonance, we can do some nifty things. Resonance allows for us to tune circuits. At resonance, we can pick a frequency and, and shunt it to ground and tune out that frequency. Or at resonance, we can tune a frequency and allow it to pass and nothing else to continue on in the rest of the circuitry. 
Now, here's a part that's important before the break for you to understand. There's one more component of this we need to discuss. Guys, you don't have to remember this formula exactly, but it helps to understand this. So keep these formulas in, in, in the back of your mind. We have one more thing to deal with. Every circuit, no matter what it is, has some amount of capacitance, some amount of inductance, even a straight wire does, and some resistance. Resistance is also measured in ohms. And we have a new term I'm going to introduce. It's called impedance. Impedance is the total amount of resistance plus reactive, a capacitive reactance and inductive reactance. If you put them all together, you get the resistance of a circuit. I'm sorry, the impedance of a circuit. You know, if you buy coax for a radio, it's going to come like 52 ohms, roughly. When they say that, they're referring to the impedance of the wire. Let me explain that that is by convection been decided and chosen, happens to be by the U.S. military, and now the world around uses it, as the default output of a transmitter. We designed the output circuits to output to a 50 ohm load or antenna. And if we look at a coax and we look at it sideways, we can see from the side, if we cut it down the center, we could see that there's kind of like two different plates, the whole length of the coax. The whole coax is, in a sense, a capacitor. Likewise, Every length of wire has its own small but present inductance. The longer the wire, the more. And then, of course, any wire has a fixed value per foot of resistance. In the case of a coax, the resistance is, the physical resistance is very, very small, minute compared to the capacitive reactance and the inductive reactance. But the combined total of them all will equal close to 50 ohms. And the radios are designed to look for that. They're designed to what we call match to it. And in this circuit here, drawn here, and, and I don't remember why for the class that I drew this for, but this is... Uh, a five ohm inductor. That means at whatever frequency we said this was at, this is five ohms. This is 55 ohms. In fact, if I picked the frequency and just plugged it in here, we could then turn around and calculate what these had to be using these formulas. And this is how we design tuning circuits. Good example of a tuning circuit is when you tune a radio to a channel to a frequency. It's changing a capacitor or inductor, usually a capacitor, to tune within a certain range that this inductor will allow it to tune. And it is only allowing through what you want it to allow through. Okay? So we want a particular frequency we want to listen to on radio. This would not be a signal source here. But if we had a tuning circuit, well, this would be a variable tuning tuner. We would tune the knob, and it would, at the point of the frequency that we want to listen to, the capacitive reactance would be exactly the same value as the inductive reactance. We're going back to this drawing, but I've changed a few things. I picked numbers that are to design to be easy to work with, but I hope I didn't do myself. Imagine, if you will, of course, in ham radio, the frequencies and the values are going to be very different. Imagine we had a, a, 
oscillator making a frequency, a wave at a frequency of three hertz. That's pretty low. You can't hear an audio signal that low. Your dog might, but I doubt it. But it is possible to make some audio frequencies that low. And let's say we had a, a 10 farad capacitor. It's about the size of a gasoline tanker sitting out back in the back, but we'll go with it. Okay. Uh, it's not quite that big, but it's pretty big. And we want to know how in the world do we determine what size um, what size uh, uh, inductor or coil we need. Now, there are formulas that tell you um, if you take a certain size wire and wrap it in a certain size loop for so long and you stretch it in or out, you'll make uh, so much of a value of a coil. But we're not. We're going to assume that we can get any coil any size we want. We don't have to do that calculation yet. But let's say we got it. We want to know. Well, I got these. I got this capacitor. My oscillator is at three hertz. What size coil do I need? Well, we can determine x sub c, the value of the capacitive reactance for this circuit by multiplying three times pi. Let's just call that three, okay? Just to make numbers easy. Three times, I'm sorry, two times three times three, which is two times nine or 18. Wait, wait, wait. Yep, no, no, I did that wrong. I said it wrong. Two times three, yeah, that's pi. The frequency is three and then times three again. So we've got basically three times three, which is uh, a nine times three is 18 times two. Agree? Roughly 36 ohms. Does that make sense to everybody? But actually, this formula says one over 36 ohms. So I got to take that 36 ohms divided by one or one over. So I got one thirty-six of an ohm. Right? Everybody good with this? So now if I put one over 36 into all this, I should be able to, if I put, let me just uh, write it out. Um, take a this will work. No, it won't. You guys are in my way. Sorry, guys. Well, so this is now 1 over 36. Now, I can take and divide this by 2. And times 3 for pi. And times the frequency, which is three. And I would get that. Cancel this out. So if you got one over 36 over a number, you just invert this to the top. So if I went three times three, which is nine. Times two, which is 18. 18 over 36, forget the little dot there. Okay. And that's about half. So we would need about 0.5 uh, Henry's. That's a five. And that would now resonate or, or have the same reactants the same value as this. You don't have to do this for the exam. But if you ever want to, for example, make antenna traps, that's exactly how it's done. Except in antenna traps, we usually make a coil, have a value, and then find out just what capacitor we want. And then we make a trap for a specific band.
And the way we make that trap, traps will not, um, traps are put in line like this to a, I'm sorry, let me correct that. If I wanted to make a trap going to an antenna, I would have, have a capacitor in parallel to this inductor. And if these two are equal, at that point, this acts like a switch and it won't let any more, it won't let any frequency, um, I gotta think this through now, how does trap work? <laughs> It blocks the frequencies. Uh, let's see. Start with a low frequency and work your way up. So it blocks the frequencies above, below it. So if a frequency is high enough, it will always go through. But when it gets to a certain frequency low enough, it cuts off. It acts like a switch and opens up the wire. Because the... Capacitive reactants and the forward reactants, when they equal each other, they act like a huge resistor blocking everything. So virtually nothing gets through. And so that it is, oh, for all intents purposes, nothing. This is a handy set of formulas to know. It's not essential to pass this class. But it is important to know that as the frequency changes, capacitive, capacitive reactants and inductive reactances change, that they are the inverse of each other. So if you have a signal, this is another thing that reactants and, and uh, is important for. If you have a signal that you've introduced to a cat capacitor and it's 90 degrees out of phase with from that capacitor, the voltage is 90 degrees behind the current. If you find an inductor that has the same reactance, which is again, resonance to the capacitor that you're using, you find the right inductor for that frequency and that reactance, they will counter each other. So one will push it forward 90 degrees, the other one will bring it back. This is how we manipulate to you to the signals for radio. The way we get rid of the radio frequency inside a radio is again another tuned circuit. We don't want all the high frequencies above the audio range to continue on. Why? We just make a circuit that shunts it all to ground below a certain frequency and it or above a certain frequency. Then we only allow to continue on to a speaker the or towards the amplifiers of a speaker we only allow the frequencies that are going to be in the range of the audio. That's how we separate them. We do a similar thing to put them back together in a circuit called a mixer, where we combine them. We're able to combine frequencies essentially the same way we separate them, but in reverse. 